I'm here in Austin, Texas. I'm actually in the office of Gary Keller. Gary was the co-founder of Keller Williams Realty International. They just recently became the largest real estate company in the United States. He's got a best-selling book out called The One Thing. Let's go talk to Gary. So Gary, we're here in Austin. Thank you so much for opening up your beautiful office. You're more than welcome, I just Chris. Got a, I learned more about guitars than yeah. I've ever learned in my life. Awesome. Awesome. And also some business lessons in there. Absolutely. So thanks for the tour. But w the first question I always ask is just where were you actually born and raised? Or where were you born? I know you're in Austin. Everybody knows Keller Williams is in Austin. But yeah. where'd you grow up? Houston, Texas. Yeah. Grew up in Houston, Texas. Uh, lived there for uh, 18 years when I was... Um, uh, a graduate, I thought I was going to be a musician, and uh, the summer uh, after school, my uh, uh, plan wasn't that good. I went to my parents and I said, I don't think this is going to be a career. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we actually uh, applied to a college and you've been accepted. Would you like to go? Right. And I went, wow, where? And they said, Baylor University. I went, cool. So they applied for you. They did. So when you grow up in Houston, what's that like? Is it, did that, you know, is that like a, a lot of people where they grew up, it defines them. It kind of led them to everything else they did. For me, I grew up in a very, uh, you know, you went past the orange grove. And if you went to the cow pasture, you're a little too far, very rural Florida. And for me, being in a smaller area always made me want to end up in New York City or to, or to kind of tackle the big lights. What was your childhood like in the sense of, were you an entrepreneur? Were you hardworking? You know, do you remember your first job? Stuff like that in Houston. Um, yeah, the, the answer is that I, I think I've always been somewhat of a, a narrowly focused person, I, I would have to say. Uh, in uh, junior high and high school, I, I played guitar. I uh, had a lawn mowing business because I had to pay for all the equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, my um, going into the 10th grade, I was supposed to play on the football and basketball teams, on the A teams, if you will, but mm -hmm. I dropped out to keep my lawnmower in business so I could buy mm -hmm. more music equipment. You know, I think about Houston in that, uh, in, in from I have a couple of memories. Number one, I had great friends. Mm -hmm. had a couple of really great friends. had a, one friend, Kim Brightwell, who he and I now play chess with friends on, on oh, yeah. and he beats me. Yeah. Uh, I haven't won yet. Uh, curses <laughs> to him, by the way. But when we were growing up, I played chess with him every morning before school. And that was probably one of the definitive things that, that happened in my life. Mm -hmm. And I never would win. And um, later, later, much later as an adult, he and I were talking about this. And um, I said, you know, I really have to thank you for playing chess with me. I said, because, you know, you really taught me strategy. When I got to college and other places, I started winning big. Mm -hmm. And you kind of trained me. And he said, well, I want to thank you, too. I said, why is that? He said, you're the only one who play. Well, because <laughs> yeah. he, th th this guy. You're young, my, right? Five years old or so. How old were you? Yeah, Ten yeah, years yeah, old? Yeah, Ten yeah, years old. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. We were in elementary school. Yeah. And, but played all the way through, yeah. Right. The junior high and all but this. But the point is, that was not the most popular sport at the time. No, the thing was, it was a thinking sport. And he said, I got to thank you because no one would play with me. Mm -hmm. And he said, every time I beat you, you just reset the men up and said, play again. I said, oh, yeah, don't give up. Right. So, so it was I, a good personality, uh, his personality versus yours. You pushed I, each other. I would say that my friend raised me. And I had another right. really great friend, Lane, uh, that was my music connection. Mm -hmm. And we were in a band together off and on and did stuff for about three or four years. Cool. And those were the formative relationships. Mom and dad were both in the school system, teachers. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in a teaching environment. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that rubbed off on me. Well, that's great. And you know, my little brother, he went into theater at a time when everybody that was his friend was playing baseball. And that was a tough decision. You know, yeah. you're going into high school where yeah. all these people are judging you more than they should anyway. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're doing like Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so was that when you made that choice to go all in with music? Because it seems like that was your passion. I mean, I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was definitely. To, I, know yeah. I grew up in Texas where football was everything. Yeah. And all of a sudden I have a rock band and we're up on stage playing at the dance. And it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a yeah. But what I'm what I'm getting at is that sounds cool now. But when you're that kid making that decision to play chess or to go into music, not football. No, it was it, tough. They made yeah. fun of you. Yeah. yeah. They made fun of us. Cool. And you Who mowed cares? the grass? Yeah, Riding yeah, yeah. lawnmower or push lawnmower? Uh, Five dollars a yard, pushed it, edged it. Yeah, five bucks. Cool. Bagged, bagged the grass, took off. Yeah, and we it, had a big business. Actually, we used flyers. Uh, yeah. We knocked on doors. We, we developed a huge business. I mean, we so had, you, did, you never were somebody gig. to wait for 
hey, maybe a couple of the neighbors are going to ask me. No, we knocked on their doors. Yeah, yeah. we knocked on their doors and said, hey, we're mowing your neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, we charge $5. Yeah. There's evidence of our work. You can get you 20 want. these days, by the way. No, no more than that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. so you, went, you went to Baylor? Yeah. Where is Baylor? Baylor's Forgive in me. Waco, Texas, about an hour and a half drive hour okay. from here. And what did you study? What was your degree in? Real estate. There's a degree in real estate well, at that point. It, and yeah, uh, I was the first group to ever graduate from Baylor University with a degree in real estate. Cool. Yeah. So it's a Bachelor of Arts or Science? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bachelor of Arts. And what do they teach you in real estate college? Because we know the industry, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's very low barrier to actually licensing. It can't, I can't imagine people taking two or three years worth of education about real estate. Yeah, well, they're teaching you uh, property valuation. They're teaching you uh, city, local, state. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're teaching you appraisal. They're teaching you finance. They're, basically, it's all the foundational mm -hmm. underpinnings of what the industry is. What they don't teach you is how to make a living at it, mm -hmm. and they still don't. Yeah. Yeah. So I came out of college with a degree in it and had no idea what to do with it. Right. Yeah. And that, that's common amongst other degrees too. I have a sociology degree. Oh, yeah. What do you do with that, right? So when you, when you went to Baylor though, why didn't you study music? That was your passion. That's what you obviously loved. Why did you decide to go into more of a business uh, track than... I wasn't talented enough. And I, and you I knew that? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I could see it. And I didn't, as much as I love it as a passion, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to spend four to five hours a day. You know, they, uh, um, Eddie Van Halen's brother tells the story that when he would go out at night, like at six or seven at night, Eddie would be sitting on the edge of the bed playing the guitar, mm -hmm. and he'd come in at one or two in the morning, mm -hmm. and Eddie would be sitting in the same spot playing the guitar. Right. That wasn't me. Yeah. I loved it and enjoyed it, and but I, I couldn't practice longer than a certain amount. Got it. And then I set it down. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm, I didn't have a passion of doing it. Yeah. And I realized that if you didn't have a passion to spend that much time, I was mm -hmm. never going to be good enough to overcome the lack of right. talent. Golf so, is a similar thing. My father, he loves to play. Yeah. He can shoot 76. Wow. But what it would take to shoot 72, he doesn't. He would rather sure live in, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think okay, that's, that's it. Yeah, people have to make that decision, though. I made that decision. So I decided it would be a life, it would be a life hobby. It would be mm -hmm. some, a passion that I pursued. Uh, as an amateur, mm -hmm. uh, as an advocate. And you never gave it up? Oh, actually, you I play at your, at your shows? Oddly enough, and... I actually did. I went through a kind of a lost years for me uh, in my 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, you were busy doing something else? I don't know <laughs> if busy is a good word. Um, I definitely was busy doing something else, mm -hmm. but um, I, I woke up at age 40 and went, what am I doing? Why, why did I walk away from that? I, and I don't know the answer to it, to be mm -hmm. honest. But that was a real awakening for me. I went down, bought a Fender guitar, and started taking lessons, and have been taking lessons and practicing every day since. Cool. So when you graduate Baylor, mm -hmm. what happens next? I came, drew a circle around Central Texas, chose Austin, loved it. It was just the right size and, and was a cool, mm -hmm. it, felt, it felt right. So I got here, started uh, sold six houses my first month in the business in a city I had never been in. So you did get licensed, basically, as a realtor. No, well, you I came out of yeah. I came out of college with a broker's degree. Got it. So I, I sold six houses, closed five of them. I like mm -hmm. to say I closed the sixth in that <laughs> uh, Jeanette Eddins was her name, and when we started Keller Williams in 1983, she was one of the first agents to join the company. Wow. Because I never lost contact. Exactly. Right. So I like to say I closed all six. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, but so you then, sell six homes in your first year. Well, I did six homes. No, Under my, your name, or no, did my, you work for a company? No, my first month. Oh, your first month. Yeah, I sold six houses in 30 days. Got it. Got my picture in the paper along cool. with everyone else. And Why then, do you think you did so well in that first month, if I can stop you there? Um, because because my, you said they didn't teach you how to make a living, but in your first month, you started making a living. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, uh, two things, I think, happened. Number one, when I was a senior, I worked for free for the head of the department. And I would go to his office, and he had a lot of real estate magazines, mm -hmm. and I read it, and the books. And, and it was Realtor Magazine and magazines like that. And you had like Roger Butcher and Tom Hopkins. Mm -hmm. The school wasn't teaching me that. Got it. But I remember reading a Roger Butcher um, um, article and, uh, Roger and, 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 and going, wow. And Roger said, get an audio uh, cassette player. Mm -hmm. See the year, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. audio cassette player get books on tape and start educating yourself. So I bought Roger, I, I cut out the ad, bought Roger Butcher's tape set Got when it. I was a senior in college, mm -hmm. uh, was reading Tom Hopkins. So I was getting educated. Sure, self-educating. On, on, yeah, on, on how you build a sales career. So I came out of college and I understood 
These mm -hmm. are the things I need to do. And were they teaching systems the way that Keller Williams is Yeah, doing? absolutely. So, yeah. Roger Butcher, well, Roger Butcher was real clear. He said, go get a card file book, card file box, A mm -hmm. through Z, January to December cards, right? Your database, mm -hmm. every time you meet someone, generate two cards. One is your permanent database with their address, contact yep. information for your mailings. And the other one is when you need to talk to them next and what about, mm -hmm. and file that under January through December. Got it. So I had this card file box. So I was lead generating, calling expires, knocking on doors, mm -hmm. calling on FISBOs, holding open houses, mm -hmm. uh, calling newlyweds out of the newspaper. I had a deal with the moving van company, Beacons, that I would give them all the new listings that came on the market mm -hmm. for people who would need to be moving at some point. Mm -hmm. And they would give me the list that was coming in of all the inquiries about yep. moving to Austin, Texas for me to contact. Contact. Got it. Hired an assistant when I was my first year in the business, part time. She worked two hours a day, mm -hmm. and what she did was she showed up, and we had two folders: the my call list and what I'd done with it. Mm -hmm. So every day, our job was we simply did this. It wasn't it, that's all that's all it was to it. I had a card file box system, mm -hmm. and I had two folders. And her job was to create my call list. Mm -hmm. So she would cut out FISBOs, cut out expired. She'd cut out Got you it. know newlywed couples, anybody that might need real estate mm -hmm. at any level. She cut that out and you give me the contact information. So when I came in the, in the office mm -hmm. around six every morning, ready to go. It, there was my call list and my job was to talk to everybody in the folder she gave me. Mm -hmm. At the end of that time period, which usually lasted till noon or one, mm -hmm. I would go back to the office uh, or, or in, I'd get ready to go to lunch. I would drop that folder on the desk. Mm -hmm. Her job then was to translate that into the cards Got it. that went to the database. So I didn't close anything for, for five straight months. Interest rates had gone to 18%, by mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. Usury was at 10. So we had interest rates of 10 in Texas, but we had 14 discount points. It actually had one pay 16 discount points. Wow. Plus commission, plus title policy. Mm -hmm. So I had a seller paying almost 23%. Uh, one guy did, mm -hmm. you know, and ignorance is bliss. I would rent an apartment. I didn't know that was a lot of money. Yeah. I, that's just what it cost to sell it. And I, my closing line was they would go, that's a lot of money. And I'd go, well, do you want to sell or not? Right. And they go, oh, I guess we want to sell. Well, then yeah. you'll have to pay it. Right. So the market crashed. I didn't close anything for five straight months. I went home at Christmas and my, I was broke. I had, I had spent the commission money. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I didn't have any money. I was driving a yellow Volkswagen, living in a $225 a month apartment that I split with my old college, I mean, my old high school friend, Lane. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't have any money. And I went to my dad and I said, I need money. I need some money, dad. Yeah. And my dad said, well, how do I know you've been working? Mm -hmm. I mean, your commission, you don't have any money. Maybe you haven't been working. He wasn't being mean. Yeah. Uh, he just he wanted to know. He was being dad. I walked out to my, my Volkswagen, got my shoe boxes. got my shoe box yep. and my yeah, my yeah, it was actually two little card mm -hmm. recipe card mm -hmm. files that Roger Butcher said to get. <laughs> and uh, and had my calendar. Yeah. And I came back in, I showed him my calendar, showed him my, my database, if yep. you will, my contacts. I said, These are all the people that mm -hmm. that will be buying and selling in the future this month, this month, this month. And my dad looked at that and said, Wow, I'll I'll give you five hundred dollars for that work. Cool. So he gave me five hundred dollars. I went back, by the way, the market figured itself out mm -hmm. by January, mm -hmm. um, and I ended up being a runner-up to the Rookie of the Year. Uh, so I, without that, sudden, without that shoe closing. box, uh, the sh because it's interesting, I started in the industry in 08. Mm -hmm. My first appointment ever was at a Keller Williams office in Clearwater, Awesome, dude. and that was not the best market. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually, not went, way. I went from writing 7% loans in the mortgage business to then going into the 08 real estate market, so my timing was, was pretty pretty pitiful. Yeah. And what, what I noticed was that the agents that came up to me, they'd say, man, if it wasn't for my top producer, if it wasn't for my database, my pro manage, right? My, now we call it eEdge, right? Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for that, I would not have survived right. over those three years. Yeah. And what, I, right. what, I, what I'm fascinated to know from your perspective, because Keller's known as a technology firm. Yeah. And when you describe the shoe boxes, I think people watching this wish it was that way still. Well, and it could be. There's no reason not to. Technology. Is it still that way if you yeah. want it to oh, yeah. be that simple? Can oh, yeah. it be? Oh, sure. Exactly. A lady, in fact, I, I did a, um, a, a, a little interview talk earlier this morning downtown and a lady came up to me who's just getting into the real estate business. And she said, boy, I'm really energized. Kid, uh, you know, how do you generate leads? And the guy that was interviewing me, I said, this is how you do it. I turned to the guy and mm -hmm. I said, uh, hi, Colin. I'm Gary Keller. Nice to meet you. Yes. Hey, Colin, let me ask you a question. Do you have a, a, a business card? 
I don't have one. Yeah. Um, and if you do, would, would you be a, would you mind giving that to me mm -hmm. or give me your contact information? Uh, if you want to be offended, I'd like to give send you my uh, monthly newsletter. Mm -hmm. Would that be okay? And the guy said yes. Well, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. I told yeah. her. I said it doesn't matter if he says yes or no. Yep. It's a number. This is a yep. numbers game. Yep. If he says no, awesome. God love you. You know, yep. have a nice day. If he says yes, you take it. Yep. Now I said, now I'm not going to just send him the newsletter. I'm actually going to call him and say, hi, Collins, Gary Kelly. You may not remember me. We met mm -hmm. at the supermarket, mm -hmm. uh, and you gave me your card and said you wouldn't be offended if I sent you my newsletter. Right. But I realized we didn't get a chance to visit. Would you be offended if I hand delivered the first one? I just want to make that reconnection and explain a little bit about the newsletter. It won't take longer than mm -hmm. five minutes. If mm -hmm. I stay longer, it's because you ask me. Mm -hmm. And he's in. I told him. Yeah. Ninety percent are going to say yes to that. Yeah. So the reality is that technology doesn't improve on that. Technology just does it in different ways. Yeah. So it, it can make it more efficient. Right. It can. Right. Um, well, well, here's another thing. Like with Facebook, it's harder to say no to like, hey, do you mind if I send you a friend request on Facebook? That is the hardest thing in the world to say no to. So we understand that technology is really doing something that we should have been doing beforehand. So the ideas were not about technology. Mm -hmm. Technology is an enabler. It didn't invent the idea of a database. It didn't invent the idea of continual contact. Or scripts or any of that stuff. No, and the thing yeah. that makes the internet so powerful is that they did not, they did not invent the idea of capturing customer information, but it does it automatically because you're doing business in the format that they can capture it. Right. I don't understand why when I go to the grocery store this afternoon, mm -hmm. I don't understand why they don't know who I am. Right. Because Amazon knows who I am sure. and they're marketing to me constantly. Mm -hmm. But when I go to the grocery store and buy something, they don't know who I am. And you've been going there for a long time. Been going there for 30 years. Yep. They still don't know who I am and I never get anything from them. They never contact me to have a relationship with me. I right. do not understand why the first time I went in there, the cashier didn't say, thank yeah. you so much. We would like you to fill yeah. out this card. We'd like to keep in contact mm -hmm. with you. Before there were computers, then right. when there was a computer, when they're in there, she's going, okay. Yeah. All they do is they say, what's your zip code? And that's mm -hmm. all they do. I they never. Oh, yeah. yeah. Why don't they say, and your name, yeah. and your address, sure. and... And we'd love to send a cake to your kids when it's their birthday. I don't get it. Yeah. I really don't get it. I want you to understand something. Keller Williams has no uh, market the brand department. We have no franchise sales department. We have no advertising budget to market the brand. And to compare that to my competitors mm -hmm. that spend well over $100 million a year. Yeah. It's inbound marketing, which is what I study. We and, don't spend any of that money. Yeah. And I think that even goes back to... You know, it's just really word of mouth on steroids. Yeah, right? absolutely. So well, it's still word of mouth and you know it's it still service. You know what it is? It's customer acquisition and retention. Mm -hmm. And so the model asks every business has a number of customers they need to buy X amount to make money. Yes. So the race is can you get yours? Mm -hmm. And I don't care what industry you're in. Yep. Have you figured out how many you need? So when I'm working with a real estate agent, they say, well, how does that apply? So it's real simple. How much money would you like to make? Let's pick a big number millionaire real estate sure. agent number, okay? Yep. Million well, bucks, okay, well, that, okay, well, 100,000 well, bucks. Here's yeah. what we know is you could have a database as small, we met a lady that was a, was the number one real estate agent for Century 21 at the time, mm -hmm. whose database was less than 500 people. Okay. And, and was, Christina Martinez, well, it was all investors. Yep. So she was doing multiple transactions with them at the time. Sure. The normal agent would need between two to 3,000 people. So my comment is, the, the game is, how long is it going to take you, young lady, to go meet 3,000 people that are in your database right. that you have a relationship with? That's the, that's, yep. that's the game of this industry. But shouldn't that be easier than ever when things like Facebook just do this for us? They go, hey, Gary, remember that guy you used to play chess with? They, Here he is. They will make it easier. But it's actually... I, I, but, but it's making people lazier. That's the problem. It's, been, it's easier to connect. You know what it is? But we don't want to pick up the phone anymore. Is it lazier or disconnected from what the purpose is? I love technology, and I love what technology does for me. The, the second that databases were online, I had one. Mm -hmm. And I would bring agents into my office who I knew weren't using the database, and I would say, hey, for the fun of it, why don't we send a direct mail campaign before we go to lunch today? And I would turn around on my computer and I'd say, let's pick a, a user group. So yeah. I'd go in and I'd put the parameters, up would come my, my, my sub list. Mm -hmm. I'd say, now let's go to my letters and pick a letter to right. send them. Okay, let's customize that. Take about five minutes, yeah. right, Chris? Yeah. And then I would say, let's hit, okay, let's put in, let's see, that's 25. Let's pop in 25 letterhead, yep. hit print, let's go to lunch. When we come back, the letters are sitting there. I go, dude, how hard is that? Why aren't you doing that? Yeah. Now that's what, that's what. What do they say when you ask them why they aren't doing they it? They don't know because they're disconnected from what business is. Mm -hmm. Businesses is acquiring a customer, 
servicing the customer, retaining the customer mm -hmm. for life. Mm -hmm. The game is, do you know how many you need? Mm -hmm. Because that makes it that makes it real and concrete. Sure. Do you need 500? Do you need 1,000? Do you need 50,000? Do you need 80,000? Right. My number originally for Keller Williams was 50,000. If I could acquire and retain, on average, 50,000 agents, mm -hmm. at the time that would make us number one. But by the time I got to 50, the target. bar had moved yeah had moved so high right. that, that 50,000 only made us like number five or six in the country. Mm -hmm. It took over 80,000 to get to number yeah. one. So, so the number now is 80,000. Yeah. So every day, when right. I, oh, not every day, but once a month when I sit down with the leadership of our organization, right, and they in turn work with our regional leadership, sure. we know what the number is. So the only number I care about is what? How many agents in the firm? Exactly. How many agents in your office? Right. Because we can track it and we know absolutely that if you have X number of agents, yeah. profitability is tied to that. Yep. If you're a real estate agent, I can measure your your income by your database. What's interesting is your If you system, don't have one. Yeah. Well, that's what we did some surveys at Inman. And we basically said, hey, how many Facebook friends do people over 100,000 in earnings make compared to the NAR average? Uh -huh. And they had about 75% of these top earners at the time, two years ago, had more than 500 friends on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And the average agent had under 200 friends on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So whether you call it a database or you call it social media or it's you call connecting. it e It's it connecting and staying connected. Yeah. That's what it is. And, and the internet does that better than anything. You just need to remember why you're doing it and what the end game is. Right. Yeah. So you, you start Keller Williams. What year did you actually start the, the, December the company of that we December of 83. Now? Well, I, I, I was the vice president of expansion for the largest company in Austin. And I resigned, and uh, we started two companies. It was Keller Williams Real Tours Residential and Keller Williams Commercial. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a Joe Williams. There still is, by the yeah. way, a great guy. Uh, but we were equal partners at the time, and mm -hmm. he was commercial, and I was residential. Got it. And uh, we started that firm. A year later, commercial was not viable, so um, that business was shut down. Um, I went through a really tough divorce. I'd been married a couple of years, and um, my mistake, married the wrong person for me, and, and I was the wrong person for her. The company was one year old. Uh, they started at a million dollars in what they wanted for my, mm -hmm. to buy it back. Then mm -hmm. I had to buy Williams's portion out. Uh, the, then the markets crashed. So that's the quick setup from 83 to mm -hmm. about 86. Mm -hmm. By 86, I'm hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. I've taken out life insurance policies, so if I die, the banks and everybody still gets mm -hmm. paid. Um, and uh, the markets crashed, and I go from 70-something associates down to below 40. And then you also mentioned that, you know, people looked at Keller Williams as kind of the JV team, the price per product, you know, it was kind of a new well, we weren't model. At that point, we weren't there you yet. You weren't even on not, the radar. No, 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 no. I, we were the 10th largest uh, real estate company in the city with 70-something associates in and we were we're, the, talk, we're talking still local here in Austin. Yeah, and we, were, and we hadn't even done anything. So after the market crashed and, uh, and all these people lost, and then and then a Remax office opened and took five of my top ten producers, and then came back and took all my entire staff. Wow. So I have no staff. I'm now down to 33 associates. The market's crashed. I'm hundreds of thousands. Commercial of dollars divisions in debt. are already I'm shut living down. In, I'm <laughs> living uh, out of my car, and I'm living in a rented apartment with no furniture. Now that's my scenario. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You grab the shoebox, right? You, you, grab, you lean on people. I was desperate. Yeah. I, I didn't know what to do. What I knew was I needed to make a lot more money than I was currently making or I was going to go back to selling real estate. So I sat down with my people. This is the shorter version of what happened. But in the end, I sat down with some of my trusted top agents and said, look, I got to change the company. I got to do something. We got to go faster. Mm -hmm. And the way I describe it is I had gone through hopping. Um, I'm six feet tall, so I went through hopping about six feet high and fell in a 10-foot hole. And I learned, needed to learn to hop higher or mm -hmm. I was never going to get out. So I came up with, with what we call today profit sharing. At the time it was income sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and said, look, what I can trace is uh, that most of the people that are here are because of some of the else in the firm. Mm -hmm. So I'm simply going to pay you for that production, just like an owner gets paid. That's yeah. how I get paid. So I'll pay you that way too, sure. but you don't have to manage them and you're not legally liable for them. Yeah. You don't have to do anything. Just get them in the door. Introduce them to us. If they join, we'll, we'll connect you to them. And after three years, you're vested for life. You can die, you can go to work for my competitor, mm -hmm. and I'll send you whatever money is there forever. Mm -hmm. Well, income sharing didn't work very well, so we converted it to profit sharing. Yeah. And the reason was- Income sharing 
doesn't work just from a financial model perspective. Well, here's why it didn't work. I went to a compensation expert because it was the, 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 all of a sudden the agents kept wanting me to spend more money. And I went to the compensation expert out of Dallas and I said, this isn't working right. And he looked at what I was doing. He said, well, number one, I think what you're doing is really awesome. It's brilliant. It's, it's smart. But secondly, you've made a fatal error. I said, well, I know I've made an error somewhere. <laughs> what, what is it you're seeing? And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Uh, beside all the other reasons that you would do it internally for owning a company, what's the economic reason? Why do you own one? I said, well, to make a profit. And he said, yeah. He said, but you're not profit sharing, right. you're income sharing. Got it. So you're sharing off of gross income. Mm -hmm. You're not sharing off of net income. Sure. So how much you spend doesn't matter to them. They get paid regardless the right. same amount of money. So they're going to keep pushing you to spend oh my, more. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm with this is unbelievable. So I went back mm -hmm. and immediately uh, flipped it. And let me ask you this. Did you ever have ambitions of being a national real estate company? Or were you just trying to kick butt in Austin and really just survive against some of the companies that had a competitive advantage? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the answer is at that point in my life, um, I was just trying to solve all my problems. I'd like to take credit and say I'm really smart. I had this big vision because today uh, I'm known for saying think big and aim high. The reason I say that is because I wasn't. It's not because I always did. Mm -hmm. I say it as a reminder, why not? Why not think yep. big? Think as big as you can then double or triple it because what happened was I was blessed. My solution was a big solution. Mm -hmm. It was bigger than a city. Mm -hmm. it, it, I didn't realize it, but it was an answer to a question about how to run a real estate company differently. Mm -hmm. Because you start off with uh, profit sharing and then they came in and said, well, this is great, but what if you die? I went, oh my gosh, they care if I die, this is amazing. So I created this, what we call the Agent Leadership Council structure where I took the policy of the company and I divided it among local, city, regional, and national. So mm -hmm. I really created a decision-making structure and signed over the rights to make certain decisions mm -hmm as an owner of a company. So I'm giving up now 49%, up to 49% of the, of the profit, mm -hmm. and I've given up a certain amount of the decisions. Mm -hmm. Where does that happen on this planet? Yeah. In well, a privately held company to boot. So then- well, nobody would fund that idea. No, they didn't. I actually at one point went to look for venture capital and nobody wanted to fund it at all. No, thank God. But nobody <laughs> would give me any money at all. Um, so, so, so what then, happened when you, when you do this and we're, we're in Austin still, and you were at 33 people, it's real simple. What happens? The, the, we grew the, to over a hundred overnight. We were the large one year later, we were 130 something associates in the largest real estate company in Austin. They got to realize we'd had 5,000 members on our board, but we dropped to below 1800 because of the market conditions. Uh -huh, right. So all of a sudden a hundred and almost 140 agents. You're at like 7% of every agent in the city. You're, you're yeah. big. And then, and then as the market came back, of course, we came back with it. Sure. So, and um, then you basically look at what you've done and go, wow, I wonder if we could do that in some other markets. That's exactly what happened. Well, what happened was actually my associates came to me and said, what if we knew people in other cities? Could we get paid on them Got as well? It. And I said, sure, why don't you all go down to San Antonio? It's an hour away, mm -hmm. uh, make calls, talk to agents. I'll come down, I'll rent a hotel uh, a suite mm -hmm. and I'll make presentations. Here are the times I'll make. And um, by the end of one day, I sat in front of two guys who said, we love this. We want to do this in San Antonio. Yeah. Well, I didn't have a franchise. I had signed a two page licensing agreement with them, <laughs> licensed the ideas to them. Got it. That year, they, they were the fastest growing new business in their entire chamber of San Antonio. Wow. So then you take a step back and go, we're on to something. Yeah. And then I made every mistake in the book. I went yeah. out and went into multiple, I went into Corpus Christi, Houston and Dallas, all with, with wrong decisions for us. Uh, and I had a mess. I, in 1988, I came back to Austin going, this is a mess. And I was driving to a different city every, every day. I was, if it was, uh, if I was in Houston, it was Tuesday. Yeah. Because every Tuesday I was in Houston. Right. And then Corpus was Wednesday. Right. And then Thursday was Dallas. And then, right. And that doesn't sound like a, a, a lifestyle or an operation system that's very much in line with the one thing. And to, to don't list, it sounds like you were. That was horrible. No, kinda, no, no, is this no, where kind of no. some oh, of your. I, uh, affection no, no. for kind of systems even got deeper because well, how do you grow? Well, let's 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 get to a bottom line truth here. Successes are just individuals who failed and didn't stop. The the idea that successful people aren't failures is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Everybody fails. Everybody screws up. The trick is is are you going to give up? 
okay, successes are simply failures that didn't stop. Right. I've made every mistake in the book. I don't, uh, in any book that I've written or anything that I've tried to teach, I, I, I usually try to point out, I really am qualified to talk about this, not because I succeeded, mm -hmm. but because I failed, screwed up, and made all these mistakes. Mm -hmm. I had my, the first agent I ever hired, uh, Gary Gentry, came to me years later, and he said, I really respect you. You're very inspirational. I went, oh, wow, that really touches me. Thank you. He said, yeah. He said, I've never seen anybody screw up as much as you and go on to succeed. Yeah. Very inspirational. I went, okay, I think you complimented me. I'm not sure. <laughs> but actually, I, he was, and yeah. that, that's the secret of success. So when we think mm -hmm. about... Um, thinking big yep. about implementing systems. I kind of was backdooring my way. Yeah. And then I looked up and went, oh, hold it. When I look around, that worked, that worked, that didn't work, that didn't work, that worked. I'm gonna do more of that and right. less of that. And, well, then, and then that's how success begets success. Systems allow you to analyze these things. So what I think you did, did a brilliant job of is if you'll put this layer of systems at the base of your business. Oh, yeah. You can have 20% time like Google and side projects. You can write books, you can love music, but, it, but you have, to, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to literally be able to, uh, you have to really be able to give up a lot of control probably too. Well, here's the thing I figured out. What I figured out in the 90s was that I'm actually a closet, te I was a closet teacher. At the end of the day, uh, music, though it was a passion, it wasn't a passion that I would do for free for four hours a day but teaching or helping someone better their life. Yep. I'd do that 10 hours a day, eight hours a day, every day without pay. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it. I was out there helping people without getting paid. And all of a sudden I looked up and realized, that's my thing, that's, that's my thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I ended up firing myself, hiring Mo Anderson, which was an amazing hire. And Mo started running the company, mm -hmm. and my job was to support her Got it. and become the teacher in the company. So since about 94, 95, I've been almost like the resident uh, coach teacher for the company. Sure. I don't run it because behaviorally I'm not perfectly suited to do that. I would kill it if I ran it. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand management. I understand leadership. I get all of that. I understand. But I, I, am, I uh, deploy it within a framework of what I'm Mm -hmm. capable of doing and sure. doing well. Short of that, I need other people. Yeah, and you know what? I, I was listening to Condoleezza Rice recently. She said, the more people you surround yourself that'll tell you the truth, the more successful you'll be. Yeah. And that gets tough with guys like you, Gary, right? I mean, it's hard for somebody to come to somebody like you and say, you're making a terrible decision or this is not the direction the company needs to go in. Well, if you create forums where you openly invite that or you create dialogues with people where you openly invite that, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was one of the things that I, I did well and still do well, is I'm willing to listen. You yeah. know, the, the, if you think about my competitors, just as an example, one, I'm the only either chairman or former president of any of the competitive organizations in my, our industry for mm -hmm. the last 30 years that even wrote a book worth reading, no mm -hmm. offense. Mm -hmm. But I invest all of my time at the real estate agent level. I spend no time at any other level. I am the advocate of the real estate agent and mm -hmm. have been for over 30 years. And I realized, particularly in the 90s, mm -hmm. that, that I had a passion for that. Mm -hmm. I love salespeople. Mm -hmm. I love the real estate agent. I love that. I love our industry. Yep. And I love the men and women that, that do it. And I made a pledge right then and there that I was going to invest the rest of my professional life dealing and dealing mm -hmm. in that area yep. helping and supporting those individuals which is again flipping the model because typically the customer of the franchise is the broker owner yeah. not the agent and what i think the reason i think it had kind of the jd power impact right the the customer service award some of those things is because every wedge this was in a different talk with christina wise who mm -hmm. studied directly under you at some point awesome. in her yeah. career you bet. there there's the, every wedge between the top of the company and the person that buys and sells the home it is a wedge of just disconnect you not you don't have empathy for the end user so by you focusing on the agent who is one degree from the buyer and seller right. versus the owner who's two degrees that's a big deal. It's a big deal. And it's, it, 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 it keeps me... Uh, Enjoying what you're doing. Deeply passionate about it. it. It puts me on the front line on a day-by-day -day basis. 
it has me dealing with the men and women who generate 100% of all the money, right. by the way, and spend 100% of their time with the buyer and seller. Right. So, I, I, so in, in essence, I fired myself, went back to my mm -hmm. passion. Yeah. And I would I'd basically not do this for free, but I do it for free. I mean, yeah. if you think about it. No, I, I, I totally understand because I'm doing this for free today. Yeah, we yeah. talked about that. I, I get awesome. doing things for fun that you love. So just a quick story. You, you shared so much and we're going to end with a couple of the questions I mentioned earlier. The one thing you'd do again, the one thing you wouldn't. But I wanted to share a story with you. I told you my first ever appointment was at a Keller Williams office. Yeah. And I went in and I was, you know, pretty nervous, obviously, you know, presenting in person for the first time ever. I'd always been an inside, you know, phone sales guy. And I got about 15 minutes into the presentation and I was talking about Zillow and Google and the web and how things were changing. And uh, after about 20 minutes, uh, like the oldest lady in the room kind of raised her hand. She said, hey, Chris, you're doing great. I said, oh, thank you. You know, like you said. Awesome. And I said, she said, but there was a guy that came in here about a month ago and he basically said all the stuff you said. And we thought you came here today to help us with the stuff that we already bought. That was my first appointment. Mm. And I turned off the presentation and we turned on the database and we started training. Mm. And I had a calendar that was 110% full of trainings and I was double the number two sales guy in the company. Yeah. So that for me was my one thing. Yeah. And so what I took when I started my own business, I said, my one thing is helping realtors improve their business through there technology. Go. There you go. And this is a way to do that. That's and awesome. dot loops a way to do that. Well, and everything I do you. now, I vet against that. So, well, thank you. Uh, and I also want to share that after the first year on the job, making more money than I'd ever made, taking that approach, I bought an F-150 that was bright red mm -hmm. because 75% of my income was from Keller Williams appointments. Awesome. When, when you would go to a Keller Williams office, there'd be 40 people excited to see you. When you'd go to a different brand, there's like a guy playing Sudoku in the back, you know, with one eye closed. And to me, I saw this in 08. You didn't have to wait till 2013 to tell me you guys were gonna outgrow some of the other people. I, I could see it in the trenches five years ago. Yeah, it's, it's, thanks for sharing that story. It's, yeah. You know, what's really awesome is um, that I think it's the it's the the training base. It's it's the the caring and the sharing. But what's happened is it's all taken on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. In other words, Keller Williams has become basically a vessel for that. Yeah. So today, I I can actually take credit for none of it. it it's it's so beyond anything that I do on a day by day basis mm -hmm. or have you know, uh, I can't take credit for it honestly. It, yeah. uh, people found. Um, uh, a way of connecting to what we were about, Chris, mm -hmm. and they've made it their own. Yeah, and and it is theirs. It's not mine. It really isn't. I'm very yeah. humbled. It's uh, it's someone, almost like just letting it kind of go. Well, out. Some, someone one day introduced me as the founder, and I said, "No, the flounder." I said, "Don't ever say founder again." Mm -hmm. I said, "Because trust me, I said all I've done is flounder." The company built itself. Company built itself. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was here. Here's the thing that I try to teach my kids at, 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 when I teach at Baylor is I go, um, look, success is inside of you. Don't seek it from the outside, let it out. Mm -hmm. It's already there. Everything you need to be amazing and have an awesome life mm -hmm. is, is right there, baby. Just let it out, right. let it out. Let d Discover yourself and yeah. let it out. So look inside before you look to tools or training or whatever, you've gotta be yeah. at your core ready for those things. Uh, the, the idea that opportunity plus preparation equals success. I think opportunities we can't always control when they're gonna come. Three years ago, I never would have had an opportunity to interview you, but I've been preparing and I'm doing a pretty decent job today. So I think it's really about, I always just say sharpening your ax. Sometimes you're gonna have a, a, a season where there's a million trees and you, you, you make a ton of money because your ax is sharp. Sometimes there's not a million trees, like when rates are at 7% on a 30 year fix or 18% or when the market is just oh, yeah. doing this. So oh, yeah. to wrap up, you know, the book is called The One Thing. I read it, I loved it. Uh, for me, uh, some of my favorite books prior to this were uh, one book called Rework, which is from uh -huh. 37 Signals guys. One book called The Four Hour Work Week, which was another kind of take a hard look at what really matters. And yeah. so for me, this is actually a perfect book for the audience that I have and, and that you have because the last five years have made that shoebox example you, uh, it, it seems like a, an eternity ago. It seems like the Flintstones and now we're in the Jetsons and in the world of so much noise, how do we find that one signal, right? Chris, the, the, the reason that, that 
I wrote this book is because I wanted to give people a license to do less. I wanted people to understand that uh, perfection is overrated and that trying to run around to do everything has nothing to do with extraordinary experiences in mm -hmm. life and that it's a lot simpler than you think. Uh, and I didn't make it about real estate for a reason. And that is because I, I not only wanted you to read it, but I wanted it to. I wanted you to give it to your wife. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to to pass it around. Yeah. My mother read this, by the way, mm -hmm. and she's 83 years old, and she goes, "You know what? I don't have a one thing right now." And I went, "No, you don't. Dad's been gone 10 years." I said, "No, you actually don't. You you know, you yeah. need it." And she said, "You know what? I was a home economics teacher, and I never produced a cookbook." My one thing is, I'm going to produce a cookbook of wow. all of my favorite recipes. Would you help me? And I went, absolutely, Mom. That's awesome. Yeah, and she's fired up now. So her personal one thing right now is mm -hmm. to produce a cookbook. Yeah. yeah. So the, the point is, is that my son read this, and, and I write for him. My voice is very mm -hmm. parental because the person I'm writing to more than anyone else is my only child, and I'm writing to him. Mm -hmm. Well, he read this. It took him a couple of months, by the way, yeah. but he read it. I didn't make him read it. And then he called me and he said, I figured out right now my one, what I need to practice in college right now mm -hmm. in order to further my career, and I'm making that my one thing cool. right now. And I went, wow. Well, that must feel great. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, but that's my point. Yeah. If I had written it about real estate. Yep. I wouldn't have been able to give some lessons to my wife. Like, you know, I, I agree. Well, she read this, and one night we're standing at the at the at the sink, and I turned to her and asked her to do something. She said, uh, "That's not my one thing right now." <laughs> yeah. I went, dishes. Uh oh, yeah. Well, it wasn't dishes; yeah. it was something else. But but the, the I went, "Oh my gosh!" But you know what? My wife read this book, mm -hmm. and she said, "You know what? I don't." She says, "You have music. You've kind of made that your yeah. passion, one thing." Uh, but I don't have one personally that's mine like that. And mm -hmm. I went, uh, "No, you don't." And she said, you know, I thought about it. I want to do art. And so we, we, I went and said, well, well mm -hmm. who, would you, would, would, who would you take lessons from? And she said, well, I'd love to take from this lady. I said, why don't you call her? And would there be someone else you'd go with that would make mm -hmm. it fun? Yeah, I'd like to invite this woman. She called her woman and said, I'd love to go with you. Yeah. you know, and all of a sudden, my wife is now taking art lessons. Yeah. The, I other think night, the, the, the other night I called her. I was running just a little late. And usually it's, uh, uh, you know, you're running late. And, uh, but I called her and I said, hey, I'm, I'm 45 minutes late. I'm so sorry. She says, yeah. no problem. I went. Well, that's different. Yeah. And I got home, guess what? She's painting. Well, you know what it is, that if you help other people find their one thing, you know, that's probably more powerful than even finding your own. Well, then remember, it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. It's not one and only. Mm -hmm. it, the, the idea behind this book is setting up a domino run. Mm -hmm. So the issue is go, you can go to the biggest end you can imagine for your life, your marriage, your spirit, your physical life, whatever it is, and work backwards and see if you can figure out what you should focus on right now mm -hmm. that, will have, that will have the biggest impact today and knock over the next domino. Right. Does that make sense? It does. And that's a you know that um, that's how the Keller Williams culture got started. Mm -hmm. You knock over profit sharing, which mm -hmm. knocks over decision making, which right. knocks over open books, which knocks over training, which mm -hmm. knocks over technology. Right. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. it becomes. It looks like it's complex. Yeah. It could be the one thing this hour. It could be the one thing today. The one what? thing this week. Uh, by the way, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's trying to be present in the moment, always balancing the present with the future, right? Yeah. Uh, having fun in the moment, mm -hmm. but also being productive that if you live tomorrow, that you have a better tomorrow or more opportunity tomorrow. Exactly. And, and is it just the one thing.com where people could go to buy it or is it on it is. Amazon? It's, it's all on over. Amazon. It's a Barnes Bestseller. And, yeah. and Jay Papazon, co-author, want to awesome definitely give a, a great uh, yeah, shout out to him yeah, as well. Absolutely. Well, Gary, thanks for your time, man. I know a lot, welcome, of, Chris. a lot of people have heard your story potentially. Maybe Maybe if they've gone to your event or mm -hmm. if they've read, uh, you know, your books are not about your story. That's that's why I think they're so popular. Shift, what was needed at the time it was written. Right. Uh, MREA, obviously a game changer. And now the one thing. So congrats. Thanks for taking Thanks, the time Chris. to spend You're with welcome. me. Thanks. Thanks. See you, bye.